Greetings, everyone. As, as Audrey mentioned, my name is Ashley Johnson, and I'm the Senior Director for Energy and Environmental Affairs here at the National Bureau of Asian Research. We're delighted to have all of you join us for this very timely discussion on U.S.-Japan cooperation to achieve net zero. We're also very fortunate to be joined by, as Audrey said, an excellent panel of speakers today, beginning with opening remarks from Dr. Naoko Ishii. We'll provide important scene-setting comments on kind of what is at stake. However, before I formally introduce her, um, I'll add a few of my own framing comments, kind of shaping NBR's project and this event in particular. As two of the world's largest emitters, the United States and Japan, and their actions are critical in global efforts to reduce carbon emissions and mitigate climate change. In the lead up to COP26, we saw numerous net zero strategies put forth and Japan being one of the early movers. Um, I think October 2020, one of the first to put forth those plans, the US coming out with theirs about six months later. Achieving net zero in both economies will be an immense challenge given the deeply entrenched nature of the high emitting sectors in our economies. Yet the long partnership between Japan and the US and our shared values for regional engagement present numerous opportunities for us to collaborate on energy and environmental security in the Indo-Pacific. Our goal today is to highlight some of the ways in which we can reduce emissions in these key sectors, namely industry, electricity, transportation, as well as those opportunities for collaboration between our, our two countries and others in the region. We'll hear remarks from a great range of experts on these issues to both provide important context and detailed analysis of the pathways forward. But also critical to this discussion are questions from our participants. So thank you again for joining us. And your, those questions really help us tighten the recommendations that can then help inform stakeholders and strengthen policy approaches. So on behalf of NBR, reiterate my thanks to all for your participation in this event. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to our speakers and to our colleagues at the Consulate General in Seattle. And finally, many thanks to my colleagues here at NBR, Audrey Mossberger, Tom Lutkin, Chihiro Aita, and Micah Sindelar for their hard work in organizing this event. Um, so with that, I'm now delighted to introduce Dr. Naoko Ishii. Ishii-san is a professor at the University of Tokyo, as well as the Executive Vice President and Inaugural Director of the Center for Global Commons. She has a very distinguished career with senior leadership positions at the Global Environment Facility, Ministry of Finance Japan, as well as experience at the IMF and World Bank. We cannot think of a better person to help kick off this conversation and frame some of those global challenges and to share her insights on her current work at the Center for Global Commons. So with that, Dr. Ishii, I will turn it to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really, really excited to be here with you. Um, I would like to uh, do three things in the next 10 minutes, and uh, which is allocated to me. Uh, what are the three things? As um, uh, uh, Ashley already told us, that the fat is a stake uh, we, are, we are talking about, why we need a net zero. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I want to touch upon very briefly what exactly that the, my center, Center for Global Commons, is doing. Just not uh, for myself promotion, but for the sake of the discussion and what other useful output uh, from the center for today's conversation. The last thing is about US Japan collaboration. And on this one, as also already mentioned by uh, uh, by organizer, that I want to touch upon the importance of the US Japan collaboration in actually that in Indo Pacific, uh, particularly East Asia, Southeast Asia. So that these are three things I wanna do for the next 10 minutes. So let's uh, get it started. So the next slide, please. Yeah, next one, thank you. So that then, uh, that what is the stake at our hands? We were that the, in global environmental crisis and we are approaching the so-called tipping points beyond the fits, the stability and the resilience of the earth system, which is critical for the found, as a foundation of our, of, of our humanity, the human civilization is, is lost irreversibly. So it's extremely important for us to understand where we are in terms of our relationship with the earth system, the, um, uh, that we were told by scientists that we have left the Holocene, which is a very, um, a uh, stable and then a uh, mild temperature the, uh, period, and we enter the Anthropocene, where that uh, the we human have uh, altered the function of the Earth system, and that uh, we, unless we try to uh, uh, stop that uh, this uh, uh, downward um, uh, spiral, 
we would be in a very uh, difficult and situation in the coming and the decades and the year uh, and, and the century. So that then, uh, that suggests us the fundamental change in the relationship between the earth system and the human economic system needs to be uh, needs to, to take place. And the fact are the kind of things we need to change are that then we need to change our key economic system, like the energy system, of course, that's uh, what we try, uh, uh, we address today, but also the food system, that then how to change our very linear uh, consumption production system to much more circular economy, and also how to change our uh, city system. So these are maybe four system, economic system to be transformed in order for us to continue to stay within the kind of earth limits, whether within the tipping points or the people call it the planetary boundaries. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's take a few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So the, this is actually the one major uh, output from uh, the Earth System scientists led by uh, Johan Rockstrom. Uh, that uh, they identified nine important subsystem, that sub Earth system, uh, which actually keep us in a safe and operating space, um, and they try to measure where we are in terms of their tipping points and our um, uh, current status. And then uh, the, you can see that then, uh, we have already uh, stepped outside this green zone, which is a safe operating space, and we were enter into this an, uh, unknown territory. And some of them, uh, we already transgressed as uh, tipping points, biodiversity and the chemical uh, that the areas which we already uh, step outside that then uh, 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 no go zone, uh, but then uh, the climate system, that then the land use system, uh, also you know that then uh, uh, area where we we are in a very un, um, unstable or unknown territory. So that uh, next slide, please. Please. So what we are really trying to do is to how to. Uh, 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 not to exceed these uh, tipping points and to stay within the planetary boundaries, what the Holocene that the geologists told us, that then a very stable, mild, and uh, stabilized the Earth system. It's not only us that the uh, scientists or that the uh, um, natural um, uh, nature lovers that uh, who want this uh, where we are. This is actually the, uh, from the latest global risk report, which is usually announced at the Davos time. And according to uh, uh, this survey, which is asked that then the 2000 and the business leaders, um, that then the, yeah, for the, in the short term, uh, that the pandemic still shadowed a lot, but then from mid to longer term, five to 10 years, that then are uh, green boxes, that the environmental concern loom again as a major, major uh, risks to the business people. So let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So with this uh, uh, a sense of unsustainability or that the sustainability is in question, 2015 showed that the, uh, the two very important uh, global uh, um, uh, uh, Agreements. One is that the Paris Agreement 2015, but also that the SDGs, which have a 17 goals. But how we can really understand these 17 goals of the SDGs? Uh, the right hand side on the, uh, picture showed that the, this is the way we think the very useful to understand uh, our relationship with uh, the Earth system. That the, uh, we call it the three layer wedding cake. Uh, the bottom layer uh, uh, consists of uh, 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 the SDGs related to the natural system or planetary earth system, which does include um, the climate change, the biodiversity, water, and the ocean. Uh, so, so these are the so-called um, planetary boundaries or hardwired um, uh, earth system uh, target, and then. Uh, and which is the foundation of our civilization. And beyond uh, which, um, we see that the, uh, the sustainable economy and inclusive society. So, so but without this uh, foundation of the planetary earth system, stable planetary earth system, we really uh, can't have a that, um, sustainable economy or, or a just and a fair uh, uh, inclusive society. So, next slide, please. So the question is how we can then achieve this uh, sustainable 
uh, economy and the inclusive society uh, towards 2050, not just at 2030. Several institutions and uh, do come up with this and uh, uh, system change ideas, and so they classify that a few important uh, economic system or social system and see what kind of transformation is needed for the each of the system. Uh, decarbonization of the economy and energy transition is, of course, one of the most important. That's um, uh, today's topic and uh, uh, show. So shown in the uh, right uh, bottom barb, but then uh, uh, equally important is this uh, food system, uh, uh, which is the next to the uh, energy system. Uh, why food system is important? Because then the thirty percent the GHG is from directly and indirectly the food production. Seventy percent of water is taken uh, to to grow crops, and then uh, loss of biodiversity biodiversity is, is mainly driven by the food system. Uh, so for various reasons that the, uh, to, to keep the earth system uh, stable and uh, uh, resilient, how to address that the current food system is extremely important. The smart city is another important one because 70, 80 percent of our economic um, uh, activities are from cities. So that then how to transform is it's important. Then the next one is consumption production. How to bring that uh, um, uh, our current linear consumption production to as much more sustainable uh, circularity is extremely important. Um, so next on the slide, please. Um, so, in order to address and, uh, this and, uh, system change, uh, we at the center, together with the external partners, come up with this and, uh, framework. So, we have chosen those four key systems, energy, city, food, and then, uh, uh, consumption production. And to uh, transform those key systems, we have chosen four action levers. That then, uh, the one is on how to set the target, because target is extremely important to inspire and navigate the system change. How to reset the economic system uh, here, that how to change the budget and the taxation, the pricing signal, that the carbon pricing and the pricing on nature is definitely one way to transform the key economic system. That then the third pillar is a blue one, it's just the transition. That then how to uh, um, uh, uh, ensure the transition pathway is the right and fair is the important one. So that's a third one. The fourth one is how to utilize that then uh, ongoing digital revolution and then the data science. That then uh, that's uh, the last one. So with that, we are trying to show that then what are the key things we should try uh, to transform the key economic system. Next slide, please. Yeah, that uh, we we actually that come up with an uh, uh, sustainability um, uh, global commons index uh, then that, and to measure that hundred countries contribution towards that the global environment and we have chosen that the uh, six uh, uh, global commons and to measure that the uh, fata the the footprint of the each of the hundred countries. Can you go to next slide? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, clearly shows that the uh, uh, the the status of the U.S. and the Japan, and the important thing is that the uh, uh, that the U.S. and Japan are actually the putting a lot of uh, the footprint on the environment, but that the uh, to uh, if we incorporate the trade factor, that it actually that that gets the much dirtier that the picture uh, in a nutshell that the uh, 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 developed countries have caused a lot of environmental footprint, not only just in our own domestic uh, the production, but through importation as a consumption country. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So that then this shows that then the, com uh, the comparison between one of the very green, maybe Netherlands, and then uh, then the uh, global south Indonesia, and then uh, uh, the, this the picture I have uh, show us a contrast that we that the uh, developed countries are quite uh, uh, doing a lot of good thing in terms of domestic production, but then uh, our hands get very dirty if we are. Uh, uh, bring those and uh, uh, spill over impacts and uh, Indonesia showed that very clearly that the through their production of the food and the energy and the things that then uh, their hands are quite and uh, uh, they they put a lot of emphasis uh, the footprint on the domestic consumption side 
uh, production side, uh, even if their uh, the trade uh, number is a uh, uh, factor is is less and uh, 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 the stressful. So that uh, they in order for us to address as a global citizen, this a uh, global environmental footprint. How to address this global South issue as a trading pa partner? Well, actually, that the uh, slow value chain is extremely important. I I, I understand that my time has already um, elapsed. So let's just go to the maybe last one or two slides. Yeah, and uh, this is actually one thing uh, that I want to introduce as a um, uh, uh, one way to collaborate U.S. Japan. That is actually that how to help that the Southeast Asia's that that uh, energy transition. We all know that the Southeast Asia is still at the development stage, uh, rely on a lot of coal-fired power plants. And then uh, at the Glasgow, there was a very important um, outcome uh, announced by ADB, but joined by uh, U.S. government and uh, U.S. and the Japanese government, a few uh, the European government, but also importantly commercial banks and the philanthropy. If you just go to next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is actually the clearly show that in order for, uh, let's say, the Indonesia to get out of the coal fired power plant, we need a, a, a branded finance type of facility to uh, help that the uh, Indonesia's early retirement of coal fired power plant and to help to also accelerate the renewable energy uh, to fill that gap. And we, uh, the ADB has announced that kind of facility joined by those bilateral government and that the commercial banks and the business and that to create this blended finance facility. And, and I firmly believe the climate war Climate change war is either lost or won in Asia. And in order for US Japan to really help that the global uh, net zero uh, uh, target, we need to uh, jointly uh, help this kind of very concrete uh, facility or idea to uh, to to help um, East Asian and the Southeast uh, East Asian countries to get out of uh, this this and uh, the reliance of the coal fired. Uh, power plant. So let me stop here. My time is already elapsed. And then uh, if there are more opportunities, I do come back and uh, as a Q&A. Thank you. Ishi-san, thank you so much. You've raised a number of really interesting points. And I know your comments on the circular economy at the outset is something that uh, uh, Claire will be speaking maybe a little bit about or can speak about. Um, and I think it's definitely worth a few follow-up questions. I know I'm writing some down, so thank you very much. And we'll jump to our panel and I'm, I'm happy to introduce our session moderator, Tom Lutkin. Tom is a project manager here at NBR for Energy and Environmental Affairs. So Tom, take it away. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you again so much, Ishi-san, for those excellent framing remarks. I know I also have a few questions uh, and would love to hear more during the question and answer portion of our uh, roundtable this evening. But first, I am very excited to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Claire Richardson Barlow of the University of Leeds, Ms. Mika Obayashi of the Renewable Energy Institute, and Dr. Mikiko Kainuma of the National Institute for Environmental Studies. You can read more about each of these exceptional speakers in the agenda materials, uh, which can be found on the event page um, in your invitation materials. So in the interest of time, I will only briefly introduce our first speaker before we get things rolling. Uh, Dr. Claire Richardson Barlow, uh, whose wide ranging academic interests include industrial decarbonization and questions of political economy, uh, will actually kick us off uh, by talking through some of the implications of a net zero economy for the industrial sector and reaching a true carbon neutral future in the next few decades and how that can be achieved uh, through industry. And Claire, I will pass the floor over to you. Please uh, let me know if you can't hear me or there's any technical issues. Um, thank you so much for having me. I have to start, of course, by saying, I feel lucky to follow that opening because it really sets the scene for me quite well. Um, so we've sort of established we're operating in this space globally of extreme environmental and energy pressure. And I think the United States and Japan offer some really important lessons learned for not just what's happening individually in these countries, but also um, what we could see more of and then the collaboration that the two are taking part in. So I'll really just focus on industry, but 
I look forward to the conversation with everyone else and also your questions. I think it's important to start with while we're experiencing these environmental and energy pressures and we're seeing a focus on alternative energy development and diversification of energy resources for electricity generation, governments are still grappling with the twin challenges of economic development and environmental degradation within their own borders. And that's where industry really becomes particularly important in its role that it plays in this transition. This is in part because solutions to these dual challenges must include both short and long-term solutions to both the US and Japan, as well as others, heaviest emitting industries, which tend to be those um, heavy industry sec uh, sectors like steel, cement, um, and then uh, manufacturing as well. These heavy industries remain some of the most important frontiers for decarbonization in the energy transition, as they're traditionally the hardest to abate sectors, due in part because of the energy intensive nature of producing materials, such as cement, iron, and steel, but also demand for these products domestically and internationally. The um, opening sort of touched upon some of the trade implications that come with our emissions globally, and cement, iron, and steel are not immune to those impacts. Uh, but then there's also demand for these products domestically. And then finally, the lifetime of industrial facilities and the time that it takes to update this infrastructure, as well as the cost associated with updating these um, heavy industries. A few primary innovations are being used the most widely for development of low carbon solutions to heavy industry. These focus around issues like circumventing emissions via increased renewable electricity, reducing emissions via the combination of fossil fuels and carbon capture, utilization and storage, and also improving the management and utilization of industrial byproducts across several industrial activities. And that's where some of those issues of circularity and improving not just our approach to economics and the products that we're making, but also how we're reusing those products and what sort of products are going back into the industries that are producing them in the first place. Additional heavy industry um, innovations include green steel making via hydrogen direct reduction, trials of carbon capture, utilization, and storage in cement industries are happening worldwide. Um, Japan and the United States are interested in both of these technologies and sort of the upscale of them for steel and cement. And we are also seeing renewable energy applications to chemical production as well as increased circularity and industrial symbiosis across these industries. All of these solutions, however, require very high rates of investment and political will. It's sort of the same things we're always hearing about the difficulty with integrating clean energy resources also applies to these heavy industries uh, within our national borders. And because many of these industries are in the early stages of development or deployment, they rely on additional research, research and um, development for widespread utilization. For the US and Japan specifically, their role in global industrial decarbonization is as important as their roles in global climate change abatement, in part because of the mitigation scenarios that we have seen uh, mapped out and modeled that are relevant to heavy industries in both of these countries. For example, according to mitigation scenarios for the steel industry conducted by the Japan Iron and Steel Feder Federation, hydrogen reduction, CCS, and CCUS are included in the most optimistic scenarios by the steel industry for industrial decarbonization. However, as I mentioned, those technologies are not necessarily deployed at a really high level yet. Um, there is there are a number of factors that are also preventing their utilization at the level that we would really like to see. And um, that brings me to sort of a, a place to maybe end, but also that touches upon some of the comments that were made in the opening. And that's that industrial decarbonization isn't just about tech. 
it's also about the economic and policy support that goes along with enabling that technology. So while we have these three really great technologies that would be applicable to steel worldwide, we also have to have the domestic policies that are facilitating their utilization. And one way that that one area that needs to be done in both Japan, um, the United States, across uh, emerging markets and also in Europe, where I'm currently based, is reducing industrial electricity prices. Uh, we have seen from research that reductions in industrial electricity prices have positive potential impacts on carbon emissions. The steel options I've mentioned, those three technologies, are very electro-intensive, particularly when you start incorporating scrap, recycling, and hydrogen DRI. Therefore, reducing prices can socialize the cost of renewable energy policies and network maintenance. Um, there's a number of other areas as well, but I'll just stop there uh, in the interest of brevity. Thanks so much. I look forward to talking about it more. Thank you so much, Claire. And I am also eager to delve into some of those some of those details, maybe in the Q and A. And I think that you've also done an excellent job of setting up our next speaker by mentioning this this idea about the important interplay between the electricity sector and the industrial sector. Um, so I'd like to now turn to Ms. Mika Obayashi, who will outline some of the considerations of a net zero future on the electricity sector and some of the unique challenges which are faced there. So uh, Obayashi-san, over to you. Yeah, good morning, Tom. Thank you for your introduction. I just tried to use some of my slides to explain that about the Japan status and then how we can reach the net zero. So, first of all, the US and Japan working together to decarbonize is essential for the whole world to avoid climate crisis. I think that it's a really important collaboration. From a geopolitical point of view, the energy transition to renewables enables countries that have had to rely on fossil fuels from abroad to emerge as a new, so new energy rich country. Uh, especially the country like Japan mostly relies on imported fuel. Japan made its 2050 carbon neutral declaration in October 2020, and as its recent target in April last year, announced a 46% reduction of GHGs in 2030 from 2013 levels. This target now forced Japan to make a fundamental energy transition since then, there has not been a day that goes by without seeing the words carbon neutral in newspapers. Then how is the situation? Next slide, please. In the, in the global context of generation mix in last decade, Japan increased renewables from 10% to 20%. The increases in solar and wind, especially solar power, but still fossil dominates about 70% of generation, so that Japan is the fifth largest GSG emitter globally. Next slide, please. And more than half of emissions is from only 130 big facilities, especially some of our contribute more than 30% of emissions and steel factory contribute 12% of the whole emission. Next slide, please. And go back to renewables last year's figure 67 gigawatt of PV total installation is very good achievement for the high industrialized country like Japan. It is a good record brought from German types of feeding tariff, but it also suggests, suggests that Japan needs to explore another types of deployment of renewables, such as providing incentives for rooftop solar, but also expanding roof mounted solar for factories, houses, and warehouses at the same time expanding commercial scale solar. At the same time, there is a need for greater flexibility in the transmission network, digitalization at the distribution level and the policies to facilitate this. Onshore wind power has barely increased mainly because Japan's electricity system was a regional monopoly with vertically integrated, making it difficult for small scale wind companies to connect to the grid and because of the lack of stability in renewables policy. The introduction of more st stringent environmental impact assessment for wind power than, than for coal fire power quickly increased the lead time to eight years. 
it is only the last year that the direct benefits of feeding tariffs have begun to be felt and expanded for wind power. Next slide, please. What we are learning now is that, that we should largely step forward by 2030, otherwise we will not meet the goal by 2050. Japan's 2030 target is reducing 46%, but the energy policy support 46% is not sufficient to achieve that goal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so I think that we have to accelerate the renewable expansion as much as possible, and then Japan has to phase out coal-fired power by 2030, as well as nuclear, and go for that the renewables, that the diversification of renewable energy sources, and then we can go for 100% of renewables at 2050. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a kind of a uh, Japan's figure uh, compared to other countries' figure. So the, you could see that the Japan is a little bit lag behind in the target basis. Next slide, please. And uh, this is um, one example, for example, that at the COP26, that the Prime Minister uh, Kishida made a statement of belief at the parliament, but it was the same story. At, um, they say like, uh, um, like uh, Japan will contribute to the Asia decarbonization to explore decarbonize that the summer power plant in the Asia. And then it also says like that Japan will go for the um, promoting technologies and the development CCS, CCUS and the hydrogen ammonia. And also that Japan says like a for 2050, that renewable could be 50 to 60% at most, nuclear 5% as as will be fossil fuel for the rest. And then emission from fossil fuel will be captured and stored in Japan and in other Asian countries. Hydrogen ammonia would be used as mixed fossil fuel burning, and hydrogen will be used for the uh, car in uh, car industry as well. So I think that the definition is quite important. Japan is saying decarbonization and also an abated coal to be promoted. But the, what is the unabated coal? that it may include that some high efficient coal-fired power plant or the uh, ammonia hydrogen uh, core in incineration at the coal-fired power plant. Even gray, blue, green hydrogen, those kind of definitions are not clear in Japan as well. Next slide, please, and then next slide. In order to accommodate such a large amount of, oh, oh excuse me, next slide, please. Is it stopped? Uh, no, Obiashi san, we actually have. Ah, okay. Um, okay, great. Okay, so, so in order to accommodate that the such a large scale of renewables, I think that the transmission system has to be strengthened and then could have the flexibility. That it's a, just a kind of image of Japan that on the top of the European map that you could see that Japan is the huge, uh, Jap always that the people say Japan is island country, so we cannot integrate more renewables, but the Japan is a big island that I have to say. So the um, integration of renewable uh, uh, grid, grid internally within Japan is quite important, but maybe Japan could have the inter interconnections with other countries as well. And the next slide, please. And then uh, on the side of renewable technology, Japan is a very high potential of uh, offshore wind, and uh, um, uh, Japan has enormous potential, and the IEA says Japan has nine times the potential of its electricity demand. But, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, and then for those renewable integration that we need to have the cheap renewables. And next slide, please. 
And how we can make renewable cheap is that I think that it's the most important thing is like a meaningful carbon pricing system has to be introduced in, in Japan. Tax for global warming countermeasures introduced in 2012 for all fossil fuel uses, but still currently only uh, CO2 prices is a pattern basis is only two, $2 in Japan. So the, it makes that rather the coal-fired power plant is quite com competitive with other energy. And still, the coal is the cheapest energy source in Japan. So the, we should have the, um, a meaningful the, uh, way that the, um, to make the renewables can compete with the fossil fuel. And then phasing out coal by 2030 is quite important. Increase renewable around 50% ambitious 2030, 2050 target. And as I said, increase, increase the flexibility of the grid structure operation and uh, take out artificial market barriers and make the market more efficient for renewables. And stop financing fossil nationally and internationally are quite important. And uh, thank you for the uh, attention that I will stop at this. Thank you so much, Obiyashi san um, Again, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear some of the points that you're bringing up, especially about, um, about the potential that there is, but about how much space there is to grow, um, particularly in Japan and, and also in the rest of the world. Um, I would like to now move to our final speaker, um, Dr. Mikiko Kainuma of the National Institute for Environmental Studies. Kainuma-san will close out our presentations with a discussion of decarbonization within the transportation sector. Uh, Kainuma-san, at the risk of uh, over punning this evening, I'll hand the wheel over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you see my slide? And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel discussion. Uh, so today I introduce net zero transport scenarios analyzed by AIM model. It's Asian Pacific integrated model, uh, which we have developed for last more than last 30 years. So next slide, please. So uh, AIM team analyzed two net zero scenarios to 2050. One is technology scenario. In technology scenario, net zero emissions are achieved through developing a wide range of low carbon technologies. The other scenario is called technology plus social transformation scenario. In this scenario, in addition to deployment of technologies, the social transformation is assumed. The social transformation reduces the energy service demand with the help of the progress of digitization and circular economy that uh, Isi-san already explained. And in the transport sector, traffic volumes are expected to be decreased significantly. Technologies uh, will be introduced such as, uh, uh, no, no, back, back, can you, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, introduced uh, such as energy efficient technologies, renewable energy and electrification and uh, hydrogen and hydrogen based synthetic fuels and CCS and negative emissions. As for uh, social transformation, we assume uh, several things such as uh, efficient use of materials, uh, lifetime expansion or structural optimization are reuse and recycling, et cetera. And uh, uh, this could reduce the in industrial production in 2050, we expect 15,000 reduction. And passenger transport reduction through the digitization and the logistic efficiency improvement through digitization. This could reduce in the passenger and free transport volume in 2050 20, by 20%. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, this slide shows the uh, final energy consumption in Japan. And the final energy consumption in Japan in 2050 decreases by 42 to uh, 49% compared to 2018. And uh, uh, for the uh, transport sector, 
uh, the uh, it also reduced uh, 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 from 70 megaton or equivalent to uh, 18 to 15 or megaton equivalent in the uh, transition scenario. It means the uh, about for 74 to 79 percent reduction can be achieved in the transition sector but as for the uh industry sector it is a little bit hard uh that in the to the transport sector so next slide next slide please so the uh this slide shows the uh final energy consumption in the uh transport scenario so the uh sale of the sum of electricity and hydrogen Increased from 2% in 2018 to 62 to 63% in 2050. Uh, and uh, the energy consumption by vehicles decreased significantly due to the promotion of electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. Uh, these vehicles are the uh, efficiencies uh, because of the efficiency is very uh, much, much higher. And, uh, some of the uh, uh, some synthetic fuel uh, come from fossil fuels, so uh, CO2 emissions from the transport sector will not be zero in 2050. So offset is required. Uh, for example, uh, for as for the transport sector, we still have 22.2 about two uh, million ton oil equivalents. Uh, this comes from the uh, uh, sin fuels. So uh, we need to some offset. Offset mainly come from uh, BEX, uh, bioenergy plus CCS. But I'm afraid this we are not so sure at this point. We we expect this come, but uh, it's a little bit hard to uh, be introduced by 2050. I'm not so sure. So uh, next slide, please. So. So uh, this is the uh, some measures uh, to be introduced in the transport sector, and uh, these are the reduction of energy service demand uh, come from reduction of traffic volumes by telework and improvement of logistics uh, efficiency through digitization and so on. And recently, the volume traffic uh, was reduced because of the. Uh, uh COVID-19 but at the same time the uh passenger cars uh they are uh, the they move from the uh public transport to the private transport so uh this could be uh in future after <laughs> the COVID settled down settled then uh may could be in uh increase but we need to uh continue some policies to reduce such kind of the, uh, to reduce uh, energy uh, uh, traffic volumes. And also the improvement of energy efficiency is very, very important and the continuous technological development and deployment. Uh, this could be done, I think, the collaboration with the US, Japan, the US. And the uh, third thing is the expansion of electrification. So remote uh, continuous efforts in line with uh, progress uh towards zero scenarios of electricity so v pv or fcv could be introduced and uh, this could reduce the uh co2 emissions and as for the new fuels new fuels are used where electrification is difficult but as i already said ammonia could be has a, a little bit problem for the air pollution uh, point of view so uh next slide please so uh, additional investment for decarbonization in Japan. Uh, so uh, we need uh, additional investment, but we can expect this. We now in Japan import uh, lots of energies, uh, mainly for oil, mainly for oil, oil, mainly on oil and gas. So this uh, oil and gas import could be reduced if we move to the uh, renewable energies in Japan. Uh, if we 
it's uh, it is sometimes difficult to, to introduce hydrogen from Australia and so. But anyway, we assume that we can provide here in this you know, scenario, we can provide uh, renewable energies in Japan. So the uh, additional investment uh, could be the uh, about 10 trillion yen, and but uh, for the net import uh, could be reduced also the uh, 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 so, uh, about 10 trillion yen, but uh, the net import, reduction of import uh, could be larger than the additional investment in 2050. So uh, I think it's a good way for Japan to move to the uh, net zero economy. And uh, as I told you, we uh, the M team analyzed technology scenario and technology plus uh, societal transformation scenario. And in the societal transformation scenario, the uh, additional investment cost could be reduced uh, uh, compared to the technology uh, scenario, technology alone scenario. So next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, some of my implications. And the transport sector will play a uh, pivotal role in achieving Japan's uh, carbon neutrality goal by 2050. And reduction of energy service demand, improvement energy efficiency, acceleration of electricity, and decarbonization of energy consist of four pillars of CO2 reduction measures. And transport management and spatial planning approaches could be effective supplementary policy tools. And yeah, uh, you know, the Japan is not so suitable for the bicycles. And so such kind of the uh, uh, city planning, could, we also need to uh, in, introduce uh, 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 so social transformation. And it should be noted that some such fuels are uh, of fossil fuel origin, so CO2 is emitted when they are used. Uh, so carbon set is needed mainly from we expect the BEX, but BEX is still has a, a challenge. And to keep uh, sufficient green hydrogen is a challenge and, and also needs a special care of ammonia from air pollution point of view. And social change, including lifestyle change, reduce energy consumption, as well as additional investment for uh, decarbonization. I uh, thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you so much, Kind of Um I think that we're we're getting some excellent um, questions coming through in the chat, but I really appreciated um, your tying in some of the questions of how these uh, how all of these sectors are a little bit integrated, and so. I did want to maybe uh, start our question and answer session um, going back a little bit to one of our, our earlier speakers. Um, we did have a few comments come through about the issue of um, nuclear power and baseload power. So I wonder if I might turn maybe to Obiyashi-san and possibly to Claire um, on what is, the, what is the role for baseload power and how do you approach um, some of the questions which are no more... Uh, in no more stark uh, realities than in Japan, I think, about um, questions around nuclear power, but also perhaps questions about um, other other sources of, of energy that can help supplement the variable renewable energy future, so. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for the question. Um, I will start from the nuclear thing. Uh, for one thing, the lead time for nuclear power is too long to be ready in time for the climate crisis. And another, nuclear power is too expensive. If we have the same amount of the money, we should put it into energy efficiency and renewable energy. But fundamentally, I think, as Ms. Ishi said at the beginning, we need to think about the sustainability of our society and the environment in terms of many different factors. I believe that only carbon is not the measure. The biodiversity, poverty, and democracy are also important factors, and generation responsibility and social justice should also be considered by us as adults living in developed countries. It is true that renewable uh, nuclear does not emit carbon when it generates electricity, 
but it does produce radioactive waste at the time of generation. And while some countries have designated sites for disposal, no country has yet fundamentally solved this problem. Even the repository would need to be managed for uh, 100,000 years. And then when we think 100,000 years ago, the time when Homo sapiens are said to have left Africa and spread around the world, I think that we should not choose such kind of energy. And then that is my point that the, about the nuclear. And the second thing about the base load energy. So you say that the variable renewables has to be uh, adjusted. And it's true that if we have the 80% uh, of variable energy electricity, but actually that there's no time that the uh, wind and uh, solar stop at the same time, at the, at the same minute or same second. So, um, as I mentioned, that we should have the very strong flexibility in the grid system. And as well as I haven't mentioned, but the storage system could be a huge option in Japan as well. And then according to our scenario for 2050, 100% renewable energy scenario for Japan, the, uh, we intentionally include some imported uh, electricity from abroad, like uh, interconnectors, it's, it will be 10% to um, manage the Japanese electricity supply, but others will be uh, produced that in Japan. At that time, 100 renewables and uh, most of it that uh, coming from the uh, solar and wind. But at the same time that uh, if we have, uh, we, we should explore the on-site basis solar power, such as prosumer base of uh, electricity solar power, for example, 250 gigawatt prosumer of uh, solar power will be integrated at that time. And it played a huge role that uh, um, uh, in that scenario. So I think that the base load concept is now gone because that everything is flexible and that we have flexible demand as well. So uh, we have to change our mindset, flexible transmission system, flexible uh, storage, as well as that we will have that the hydrogen fuel that in future. So that is my um, idea for the 100% uh, renewables. Uh, can I say? Absolutely, Kanuma-san, please. Okay, uh, thank you, um, and I uh, completely agree with you. Your with you, and uh, just I want to add one thing, and I show to the uh, scenario analysis, and the scenario analysis is not just we should go this way, we should go that way, but it's not, and we find what is a problem, what a challenge, and if we go there, and what. Uh, there is some challenge. As for the base road, and uh, we, there are so many uh, scenarios uh, uh, for this issue. And uh, yeah, there is uh, sometimes we have a criticism that today this in uh, renewable energy is a problem for the we need a base road. But uh, as for this this uh, sin several scenarios are presented. Many people also suggested the new ideas to uh, to uh, compensate this uh, base of the, the lack of the energy. So uh, this is the the role of scenario. I think I I, I want to add this thing that the role of scenario. Thank you. Absolutely. And in the interest of time, uh, Claire, I just wanted to turn to you if you had any, maybe any thoughts, maybe any considerations that the industrial sector might need to, um, to go through. I know that there's, that we've already brought it up, but I do, I did appreciate some of your thoughts on maybe some of the less flashy, uh, but still just as important energy efficiency questions that, um, that do come up in these. So please, Claire. Thank you. Um, well, so I touched upon some of the technologies that we're looking at and hoping to see in these scenarios um, for the industrial sectors increase, but there are also questions about efficiency within industry as well. Um, we see circularity is always already really great in the steel sector, for example. There are improvements that can be made. And so when we're talking about improving, um, changing our approach to the way that we are producing waste and what we're doing with waste, that applies to industries such as steel, but 
cement and manufacturing as well. I would say on the less like flashy side, efficiency can always be improved. We used to think about efficiency as kind of low hanging fruit and it definitely was for a long time, but there are still improvements that can be made um, in terms of byproducts, chemicals, steel, cement. Uh, another maybe less flashy point is about um, reinvestment and the fact that really when we're thinking about steel and industry in the 2020s, leading up to these 2030, 2050 targets, we have to be thinking about the transformation that is required over this next 10 year period. More than 70% of existing coal fired blast furnaces will reach the end of their lifetimes by 2030. So we need to be reinvesting into um, either some cases, uh, perhaps other coal based steel making capacity or hopefully the technology that will be replacing those. And so what is happening as we are aging out uh, some of our facilities and what are our plans from the 2030 to 2050 period? And that's where um, those technologies are important, but also considerations about where we're gonna be placing the most importance. Is it on the manufacturing of materials? Is it on economic development or are we willing to take um, into account some alternatives and, and maybe adjustments in our approach to economics and what we expect uh, as individual countries and also as those conversations about improving um, circularity beyond a, a take make waste model that we're currently utilizing into um, a more regenerative model is really important on even just the consumer level. Absolutely. Um, I know that we are very close to time. Uh, but I did want to circle back to one of the several questions that we've had come through. Um, and I will, I will apologize to uh, Tetsuro Hisano for um, paraphrasing their question somewhat, but I think that this is a really critical question. And I might even, even welcome um, Ishi-san's perspective here um, to shorten the question a little bit. Uh, who is willing to pay the associated cost of zero CO2? What is a realistic way to realize a zero CO2 emission economy in a democratic country. And, and I welcome maybe some, some parting thoughts from all of our wonderful speakers this evening. Um, and uh, anyone who'd like, to, who'd like to take a stab at that rather, rather big and important question, I think. Um, Why don't I start? I, uh, you may remember that I presented the four by four matrix, the four system to be transformed that then, and the four action levers or enable us to trigger those transformations. And first two is actually the vision that then a clear target to, to go. Then the second one is how to reset the economic system, which does include policies, the pricing, regulation, and actually the investment. Uh, so so the, the combination of a clear target and to actually change the relative price of what, where the money should go to and where investment should go to, what the, uh, the finance and should support. The combination of those things are extremely important. And without that, that the, uh, those transformation, fundamental transformation will not take place. So that then uh, who is paying for that? It quite depends on how deep we can go for this and the policy system transformation supported by policy. Today, we didn't talk too much about uh, how much money that the need to go and, and by whom and when, but then uh, uh, if we do it right, actually that the cost, it's not just the cost, it's also the opportunity to be very well shared by that and the just and the trust and, uh, and the fair transition. So that uh, let's open our eyes and not to just think about how much more we need to pay and what kind of benefit we could also enjoy. And we need to really talk to the, uh, the policy makers and uh, about uh, the, the need for that and the policy transformation. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, any of our other panelists, just very briefly, maybe some thoughts uh, on? Uh, uh, yes, please, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. As for the uh, uh, cost, as I showed the uh, uh, slide, that the cost in the end uh, could be reduced in case of Japan because we import a lot of energy from. Uh, and so, but at first, uh, we need to invest, invest. We need money, but later we can uh, 
compensate it. You can have a fruit, but we need a long term view. So uh, we need to show the as for the other researcher, we need to show the long term view what is happening and what could be done and what could we, we can uh, have a fruit in later. Otherwise, we have a lot of risks and we can have a disaster. As Isisan pointed out, we have a, a tipping point to come. And after that, we can't do anything. We can't do anything. Thank you. Uh, Claire or Obiashi-san, um, if, if you had a 30 second stinger you wanted to have, yeah. I would just add, you know, kind of bringing us back to one of the points that was made in the U.S. in gene markets, there is a leadership role there, and there is um, not to say that the majority of costs need to come from these two countries, but there is a conversation about justice and um, ability, and also what the trade-offs are for different countries. And so, I think as researchers, you know, it's very easy for me to sit here and say. Well, we should see everyone get rid of nuclear, or we should see um, the complete phase out of coal. But I have reliable, affordable access to electricity, and the leadership that Japan and the U.S. are providing in Southeast Asia and the rest of the Indo-Pacific related to that responsibility is a really important part of this just energy transition and also reaching net zero. Excellent. Thank you, Obiashi-san. Um, I think that the Claire's remarks that it's uh, excellent that and Mark remarks that for the whole session, but I just would like to add the one evidence like a kind of a demand side actions uh, began. Like, a kind of, so we are always talking about supply side actions, how to increase renewable or something, but then now the kind, kind of companies and businesses, we want to take the leadership in the climate actions to be a kind of, a, for example, 100 percent renewables that by 2030 or something like that. And then for Japan, like a, some big industry such as Sony, Rico, a soft bank, and then they are claiming that we, we need more and more renewables. Otherwise, we cannot do business in Japan. Maybe that we will get out from Japan to be settled that in other countries. So that kind of business is coming the globally. And then, for example, that our initiative that to encourage the business to take climate actions that we started that in 2018 with the 150 businesses, but now almost 700 business and entities join our actions. So the more and more demand side actions is now began. So that's one of the force to increase that in investment for sustainable energies. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Um, it is an excellent problem to have uh, that we have such an engaged uh, discussion that we are unable to get to all of the comments and questions. So for that, I do apologize, but I would like to take a moment to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for guiding us through um, and helping us look through the, the, the crystal ball of, of the next 20 to 30 years in terms of, of what a net zero future looks like for the world, but particularly for the United States and for Japan. Uh, to close out the session, I'll briefly turn to my colleague and associate um, Chihiro Aita to finish us off. Chihiro. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm a project associate on the Energy and Environmental Affairs team at MBR, and I will be providing the concluding remarks today. First, thank you so much to the Consulate General of Japan in Seattle for their support for this event. Thank you also to our keynote speaker, Dr. Ishii, for providing wonderful remarks on the importance of protecting the global commons and how the U.S.-Japan cooperation can play a big part in that process. And thank you, of course, to our excellent panelists, Dr. Richardson Barlow, Dr. Kainuma, and Ms. Obayashi for their insights on how to decarbonize different sectors, especially when it comes to sectors like electricity, industry, and transportation. So I just want to let you know that there will also be forthcoming publications by our panelists on this topic, so please stay tuned for that. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed the fruitful discussions and hoped that the discussion and the forthcoming papers can work together to help inform the best policy pathways to achieving net zero in both Japan and the United States. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful evening and morning wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>